Okay, we have a packed house tonight. It's balmy outside, uh, so let's get started. I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Pyfera Growth Capital. Uh, myself, Sandeep Gupta, co-founder and partner. We're an impact and technology investment corp, series A and B, and we also help our issuers go public. Uh, with us today, uh, we have Steve Martin, one of our issuers who has gone public. I'll let you introduce yourself, Steve. Uh, my name is Steve Martin. I'm the CEO of Pond Technologies. We are a carbon to food play. We take untreated stack gas emissions and we grow sustainable protein. And a little bit about yourself? Uh, well, I have little, some time a little, now. A little bit about yourself? Uh, uh, my background is actually in photonics. We've been uh, very successful in, in building the bioreactors based on the sort of the convergence of technologies, some of it from my background. I was the uh, director of the Jeffrey School MBA program, responsible for technology commercialization, so I have a business and technical background, and uh, happy to be here to talk about uh, impact investing. Thank you, Steve. We also have with us Marie Ang, and uh, Marie, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself and the up and coming social venture exchange. Thanks so much, Sandeep. Hi, my name is Marie Ang, and I lead the investor relations and investor services at the SVX, the social venture exchange. SVX is an exempt market dealer, so a financial services firm that was incubated at Mars Discovery District just up the street here. And we work to build the capacity of both ventures, funds, as well as investors in the field of impact investing. And then at the end of the day, we help them to make deals with each other so that we can grow the marketplace for impact investing. About me? Yes. So I get to... I get to have the pleasure of working with our investors to understand what it is that is driving them, what it is that they're looking for from both an impact as well as a financial returns perspective. And I get to work with our fantastic issuers to understand what's driving them, what their business models have that no one else has in the market, and what kind of growth there is in store for them. Thank you. And we also have Brady Fletcher, uh, President, uh, Managing Director of the Toronto Stock Exchange Venture Exchange. Brady? Thanks, Sandy. Uh, so Brady Fletcher, Managing Director and Head of the Venture. Don't quite have the President title yet, but uh, we'll see how it goes. So I run the TSX Venture Exchange. We have 1,705 listed companies today representing roughly $45 billion in aggregate assets under management. Uh, last year we did almost $7 billion in financings for the 1,700 companies listed with us. Also brought 212 companies to market. By background, before I took over running the Venture Exchange, I was an investment banker, then turned entrepreneur for a couple of years. And during my time of, as an investment banker, I also worked very heavily in the SRI space, taking water treatment companies over to Europe, helping raise money through the SRI funds that existed, uh, as well as working for a venture capital fund that was focused entirely in the clean tech space and early stage clean tech investing. So I've got a bit of a background in helping companies raise money, grow, uh, and also an appreciation for how difficult it is to balance that bottom, that whole triple bottom line. Thank you. So we have a really expert panel here uh, on the emerging impact investing uh, sector, and we're going to do a little myth busting today, if you don't mind. So I'm going to throw out a myth or two, or a fact or two, depending on what you think about that comment, and I want you to comment on it if you don't mind. So Morgan Stanley, um, a small investment banking firm in New York, um, released a report in December 2017 saying that, um, get this, there's 22.4 trillion with a T dollars deployed into impact investing. So I'll take that first. Um, I'll start over there with Brady. We're going to go through about 10 of these, so keep your comments <laughs> so accordingly. Keep, we keep have 26 short. minutes. I'm not going to dispute that number, but I think the, it's important that we're splitting down water infrastructure investments into water treatment, into solar projects, into wind projects, the type of stuff that pension funds invest into versus the companies that are doing equity financing to develop new, new treatment technologies like pond technologies. So I, I think you, the, it's not an inaccurate number, but we need to bifurcate the actual buckets and talk a little bit more about the specificity of impact investing and how people can participate in the sector. Okay, that's great. I'll just counter that with, there's $100 trillion of capital deployed in the worldwide public markets, not just project financing. And this report says that one out of four of those dollars are in this space. Weird. Over to you. Yes, it's a, it's a very, it, it'll be interesting to see how they define this one out of four, this 22 trillion. Um, impact investing, if we can take the time to define it, 
you can define it by being, some people think of it as just being non-profit social enterprise, which of course would make it very narrow of a definition. Then you have people that would include for-profit social enterprises, publicly traded companies with a very strong impact mandate. And then there are organizations that would also include um, investments as long as they were divested from, say, um, the you know, Second Amendment rights, tobacco, pornography, sin, sin stocks, if you will. So I feel like we need to really dig into this uh, dig into this definition, though I think that it is promising to see that even taking the most generous definition, if we just want to exclude some of those sin industries, that it does, it does show market momentum and perhaps leans into some of the interest that they have been receiving from some of their customers and some of their clients. Okay, so here we go. No sin. It's, only, it's not even the, into January of the new year and we have no <laughs> sin on the table. Uh, Steve, very quickly, what was your experience in tapping into that $22.4 trillion? Uh, I haven't been able to cash the check just yet. Uh, impact investing, it's an interesting concept because of the variable nature of the definition it's sort of described here. Uh, impact investing sort of can be described as whatever's making an impact at the time and whatever meets the sort of social rhetoric or social discussion. Today, as we're on the ice planet of Hoth, impact investing would be buying a snow shovel, I think. Uh, but realistically, Pond was never presented, and I'm speaking from my own point of view, where we, we tried to assiduously avoid the idea of aligning ourselves with simply being an impact or a sustainability play. In the end, investment means money. So you have to show how whatever you're doing is going to make money for the investor and how you can create a viable business from it. The impact thing is almost like a label you slap on top of it at the end. However, um, this report points to some interesting changes, particularly you mentioned earlier millennials, who make decisions on investment quite different than perhaps uh, people of our vintage, or certainly of my vintage do, uh, which is more on fundamentals. Wow, okay, so Steve touched on three of my punchlines here, so Oops. I will have to segue quickly uh, into those. So let me read uh, from uh, Barry McKinnery, McKinnerney, the president of um, McKenzie Investments. Over the next three months, 12 months, um, three trends will emerge, and SRI, socially responsible investing, will be the biggest trend uh, with 87% of Canadian asset managers, I'm quoting here, saying responsible investing will um, grow over the next two years and be one of the biggest trends. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read a couple more in the interest of time. So also recently, um, it was reported that a collective group called the Climate 100 Plus, representing 32 trillion, again with a T, um, have forced Shell, uh, the British Dutch oil giant, to tie their executive compensation to climate impact. Now, $32 trillion, I think everybody listens on a worldwide stage. So I'll go this way, uh, Steve. So you're looking for a comment on the $35 trillion or whether or not this sort of investing, or it's a sensible thing for executive pay to be tied to social responsibility so, so sort two, of So two, two things are happening. Big fund managers are forcing change publicly either at the executive level or, in the case of McKenzie, coming out right out. And also, as we know, um, uh, Fink, the CEO president of BlackRock, which is $6 trillion assets under management, is exactly on the same page. I just want to have his quote in front of me. So there you have about a few trillion dollars saying we're going to do something about this. And I think it makes sense to do something about it. Obviously, climate change is impacting the, you know, the myriad of business options we can think of. Everything from uh, increasingly uh, uh, sort of catastrophic, catastrophic weather events to problems with sustainable food and, and, uh, and all the like. So investing in a way that allows us to be sustainable, I mean, if you just think about it, I, I, we're always looking for growth and in investment, right? Growth is a very interesting concept. I love talking to ec economists about growth. We're gonna have, uh, you know, the world economy is gonna continue to grow, except we live on a finite planet, please discuss. How, how do you have infinite growth on a planet that's limited? And you do that through sustainability. Okay. Sustainability of those options that allow us to continue to grow, make sense what they're doing. So I'm gonna stop you there, I'm gonna go over to Brady, and I'm gonna say, Brady, are these guys, are Barry and John and, and Capital 100 plus fund managers, are they going to lose their jobs because they are pushing trillions of dollars into impact? Well, I think the really interesting piece to look at is the company that they're working with. Uh, and when you're saying they're tying the executive at Shell, predominantly an energy company, to what their social and environmental impact is, then I think 
what you're recognizing is that in impact investing and environmental impact and the considerations around social causes aren't aren't tied purely to being a nonprofit or to doing something that is 100 folk 100 percent focused on clean energy you're tied to are you doing the best you can for the business that you're operating and when you think about shell it's how do you how do you expand your operations in into renewable energy how do you deal with remediation of heavy oil sands how do you deal with responsible production and what are those things that you can do as an executive team to reduce that carbon footprint and responsibly operate your business with you know, social causes at heart, um, but still operating a business for profit, recognizing that you're here about making money, you're here to grow the business, and you're here, you're here to actually build a successful business that will continue to operate and persist. Okay. And it's only from that successful, successful business perspective that you really have a seat to be able to lobby for change and to be able to have the capital and size to start pushing some of those agenda items forward. Okay, so um, I'm gonna come to you in a second, Marie. I just wanna say, these guys' job is to make money for their shareholders. And these, they have come out publicly and said, we're going to deploy our primary directive, primary objective, into impact, and yet we're still gonna make you money. I just wanna know, are, are they on track, or are they gonna lose their jobs? No, I, I'd say they're absolutely on track. You know, the, mm -hmm. these guys, <laughs> A, they've gotten to that position by <laughs> making some very good investment decisions in the past, and so I wouldn't be one to bet against them. Um, but then B, uh, you know, I think it is, it is recognizing what's responsible growth. Uh, we don't have to live in a world of, of overconsumption. We have to think about what's responsible consumption. Uh, Mark Stoiber out of Victoria wrote a really interesting book called Didn't See It Coming. And Mark used to be the head of brand advertising for, that was credited with the rebirth of the Mr. Clean brand. And he'll tell this story that he was in this advertising firm and one day his associate came in and said, you know, hey, Mark, I figured it out. We're going to quadruple Mr. Clean product next year. Mark goes, how? And he goes, well, we're going to have spring, summer, winter, fall scents to Mr. Clean. And Mark goes, that's awesome. And he goes home and he tells his wife and his wife laughed him out of the house saying, why do I need four scents of Mr. Clean? <laughs> and, it's that, and that was his epiphany that we as a society are consuming way too much and that we're constantly questing after these quarterly results and constant growth, and you need to think about what's sustainable consumption. What does this look like for us to operate businesses that are doing the right thing and not just promoting overconsumption, but providing value to customers and actually delivering what we're supposed to be working on? And so I think that's a really interesting thing to think about. Okay, good. Marie, do you have a comment on this or do you want me to move to the next point? Yeah, I mean, I think it, in terms of drivers of drivers of growth for a company like Shell, I mean, thinking thinking about a, a comparison, if we think about the share price of BP, for example, before and after the Deepwater Horizon scandal 2010, just thinking about how they have been doing since then, and that was, that was 2010, wasn't it? They still have not recovered from then. So while it was a different kind of risk there, um, there are two different drivers for impact investing, I think. There's a risk-based approach, and there's also the values and growth-based approach. So in terms of the risk that someone like, that a company like Shell has and the, those executives have, if they are not able to perform in an environment where consumers are becoming increasingly um, aware of their carbon footprint and so forth, and in our policy environment where there is going to be increasing regulation in terms of the emissions that are created and so forth, if climate change reaches a certain point, um, these regulations are only going to step up and these companies won't be able to, won't be able to survive in okay. that. So it, okay. it makes sense for them to be doing business in a responsible way going forth. Okay, I, I mean, um, so we'll come to regulation later if we have time. Um, mm -hmm. Money talks, it's the biggest regulator, yes. uh, I think. Um, so hopefully, I think what I heard here is these guys are not going to lose their jobs. They, they got to where they are. They're making intelligent decisions. But it is a little different than we used to hear two years ago. Mm -hmm. These press releases didn't really used to come across the wire two years ago. So I'm going to switch topics now to the non-investing demographic. Okay? So we're talking about the millennials. Any millennials on the stage here? Marie, you're it. You're our... You're I, <laughs> I, I invest. Do we, do we not invest? No. Uh, so, <laughs> so Brady, I'm going to go over to you again. So here uh, it says that um, over 90% of millennials will purchase a product from a purposeful company. Okay? And as we, they are investing in crypto and a bunch of other stuff, but they're not investing in traditional assets that way Gen Xers and Yers used to in, in, invest. So what are you seeing on the TMX? Yeah, it's an interesting one. And 
So when I got out of when I got out of engineering, it was the heyday of the mining boom, and we were doing. I was at Canaccord Genuity when we were doing 683 deals a year, and it was a ton of fun because you had this pace in the public markets that everybody was participating in, and there was a lot of momentum and growth to it. The reality is that the millennial generation has never seen the public venture capital model work to that scale. They've never seen that pace and the wealth creation that can happen on this platform when companies are drilling and putting that risk capital to work and helping grow businesses. At the same time, all of these people who have graduated with BCOMs and from the millennial generation have come out watching their parents make a ton of money in the real estate space at, while we've had a depressed commodity cycle and Canadian capital markets have been challenged. I think that the emergence of marijuana and blockchain has reinvigorated attention on their capital markets and that has brought an entirely new demographic to market. The comment around millennials buying from a purpose, purposeful organization, I think, is absolutely not exclusive to the millennial generation. I think that that is something that we're all becoming more concerned about. And you know, I look at I look at my parents, for example, and my dad's quest to be at zero waste. Everything is either recycled or or composted, uh, and we're seeing that we're seeing that across all generations and the entire demographic. And so I think that's. What we're seeing now is the evolution of those, millennial, those millennials having found something that's interesting to invest into in terms of cannabis, blockchain, some of the sectors that have come on. Uh, and then you know, ICOs was their version of the stock market, but they're starting to recognize real businesses grow here on public exchanges. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, we have this mechanism that allows them to participate in that growth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a question for Marie and uh, for Brady. Do you think you'll have more millennials um, putting their dollars into your exchanges? Uh, the SVX, which I'll let you define, sort of a more cr more crowd financing, more more impact, more retail, and of course the venture, which is very broad and has a lot of issuers on it. Do you think you'll get more activity, investment dollars from the millennials if you had more impact issuers? Mm -hmm, certainly. Um, I think I'll touch first on maybe like a trend and then d dive a bit more into the SVX and what we're seeing. Um, so that same Morgan Stanley report that you mentioned in 2017, it also found that 86% of millennials are interested in impact investing. So I think people of my generation, if I can be the token millennial here, we are interested in moving with our purchasing dollars, our investing dollars, our philanthropic dollars, and where we want to work. So four different movers and four different drivers of, um, of means to create impact through some kind of dollars and cents way. And certainly it's, uh, it's something that we're, we're seeing more and more. The fact that we're having this conversation on this stage in this room is really significant. Um, in terms of the SVX, what we're seeing, we are an organization that works primarily with high net worth individuals and foundations, so accredited investors who have the ability to move larger amounts of money and are oftentimes the first ones into a deal. And the beautiful thing about impact investing is that you are able to marry, um, you can marry this approach to any kind of investing, whether you're talking about public market investing, you're talking about um, real estate, or you're talking about startups. And a lot of the startups that we work with have really great AI technology built into them. Um, maybe they do have some kind of blockchain element into it as well. So you can really build all of that into an investment that has a strong social environmental objective as well as a fine as well as having a strong eye towards financial return and people are paying attention to this and the investors that we see in that uh, really resonate with the work that we're doing we find that we have a pretty interesting split between people who are nearing retiree age, so people who are in the 50 to 70 age range, and people who are in the 25 to 35 age category. So it's, it's an interesting split, and you know, some, of their, um, some of the interests that they're, that they're investing into are, are in larger check sizes as well. And I think we're only going to see this as people of a younger generation inherit more wealth. Uh, I, we included a statistic into a report that 66% of inheritors are going to switch their financial advisors. So whoever managed their parents' wealth is not going to manage their wealth when they inherit it or when they make it themselves. Wow. Okay. 66%. Brady, so it's gloves down to you. Okay. So SVX is coming up on your rear view mirror. No, no, no. We, and, and they're targeting. Let me have fun with this. <laughs> or, or maybe they'll graduate. No, Maybe no, we, we can't be nice here. This is gloves off. Okay, so 25% so of asset managers have a sustainability mandate. 86% of millennials are interested in impact investing. Was that, did I get that number right? I From, think so. Yeah, right? And these guys are laser focused on that demographic. They're small today, but how are you going to respond at the, at the venture? 
yeah. It, well, so I, I don't. I definitely don't think it's gloves off. I oh, think this is totally synergistic, <laughs> and it, it is a reality. I'm going to be gloves off in a minute. <laughs> Um, when you look at what we have with the venture exchange, it, and I go back to my investment banking days, I mean, I raised $100 million for the likes of Pure Technologies around water infrastructure management, and that was all through the European funds that we worked with. Biotech Environmental that was remediating mining, mining tailings ponds, and they had a proprietary technology that Gold Corp and Barrick were installing at mine sites. And so we've, we've had a long-standing practice of working with companies in the ESG and SRI and the impact investing space. Um, the likes of Nikoon Wind, of Canadian Hydro Developers, these guys all started with us on the venture, grew up with us on the venture, ultimately graduated to TSX. What I think we're challenged with right now is how do we surface the impact, the impact and the social good that many of our companies are accomplishing? And you can look even at, you can look even at the pipeline companies Penn West and the things that they're doing. You look at CNRL and the investment that their executive chairman has made into carbon sequestration. Uh, you can look at the likes of Pure Technologies got bought by a Chinese company, but then you know we've got Pond Technologies. How do we surface the social? How do we social surface the social good that Pond does so that the investing community and the millennials will? be attracted to that and see a, see a way okay. to say, hey, here's something I want to move the needle Okay, with. so SVX and, and the TSXV are saying that they're good. They got impact covered. So you're raising well, money. I'm going to be the contrarian. I will tell you that uh, we have anecdotal evidence, only anecdotal, that there's a great deal of skepticism of your exchange amongst millennials. We, on a fairly routine basis, receive a check, a small check saying, hey, love to buy some shares in your company, just don't want to do it on the exchange. And it's typically, we, we obviously can't take it, but this goes back to the days when we were actually a private company and the requirement is to be a, a you have to be a seasoned investor, basically you have to be a high net credited. worth individual, credited investor to, uh, to be allowed to, uh, to invest. So, I mean, I would say over the last three months, I've gotten half a dozen checks, 100 bucks to 500 bucks, can I buy some shares in Pond? Um, a millennial really think what you're doing, so we're speaking to them, but somehow the mechanisms to allow them to participate in the markets with our listing, they're not serving our needs or they're not serving their needs, one way or the other, we're not connecting. And I, I don't know if that's uh, because they're looking for different modalities or if they have a mistrust. I'm, I'm hearing mistrust when I, when I speak to them. But um, it, it does seem to me there's going to have to be an alteration of an approach to actually really get to those pools of capital and have them work in the market. Okay, yeah, I so think he wants to say something here. Yeah, so I think one of the really interesting pieces that you're keying in on is there is a general mistrust, and it's not necessarily in the exchange, but it's in the broader Wall Street, Bay Street, the feeling that the millennials are not part of that crowd. So that's where you've seen the, light, the rise of wealth simple, for instance, right? And when you think about how do you surface companies like Pond and companies that have positive social impact on the venture, when you're thinking about how do you showcase those to millennials, it's not by getting the millennial to go buy an ETF through an online discount brokerage. It's by finding a way to actually be able to showcase the good things that are going on and provide access to TD Waterhouse or an account that's willing to transact at $500. The challenge is that you know, when you're dealing with small check sizes, you need to find the right platform that streamlines that and still services that client, which mm -hmm. has been difficult to date, but Wealthsimple now allows you to, uh, to transact in specific stocks as well. So those, those things are changing, and I think the biggest piece for us is we need to be looking at how do we engage this entirely new demographic and working with the millennials, recognizing that they don't want a full service broker. They want to be able to make their own decisions. They want to be able to do their own due diligence. Mm -hmm. And they want to know that it's not a rigged game. They want to be able to feel like they're part of the whole system. Um, okay, good. I think we all agree on this. So there's money out there uh, that wants to come into two exchanges here that have impact portfolio companies. We have a portfolio company here issuing. Uh, if you're out there, investor relations guys and private wealth managers, we have to connect that money with these exchanges and to these issuers uh, because there seems to be a lot of it here. I'm going to switch topic uh, to... Um, more than half of asset managers want to learn about sustainability investing. Now, this kind of strikes me as weird because we all breathe air, water, we all eat food, um, we all live on this planet, uh, we can't seem to turn on the TV these days without something about climate change, and yet, according to Morgan Stanley, 
and they interviewed 118 asset managers, 60% of whom had assets under management over 10 billion. So if someone has assets over management over 10 billion, then they wake up pretty bright in the morning. Uh, but half of them want to learn about sustainable investing. So, um, Marie, what are we doing to in educate these, uh, these asset managers? It's, um, it's, it's interesting to hear that statistic. So, um, Essex is part of Mars, and Mars hosts the annual social finance forum every year in downtown Toronto. So, it's Canada's um, forum for impact investing. And we've been able to see the numbers over time for different kinds of demographics who come. And... It's, we have seen a bit of growth in some of the different kinds of asset managers, wealth managers who attend. Um, the, that this number is so high does, does surprise me a bit, but it, it certainly makes me glad, and I do hope that they are not just doing it in a way that they can you know, spell off the definition, but to a point where they're able to have a very clear thesis for what they consider, uh, what would they consider impactful enough to include into their products, what makes it um, not impactful enough that they would exclude it from their due diligence and so forth. And I think that um, as, invest as investors, everyone should be able to ask these kinds of questions of their managers and get a strong result and get a clear result back. In a survey that we did a couple um, that came out last July. So this was a survey that we didn't just we didn't just survey our own um, our own supporters. We got distribution through some of the big banks in Canada for this. And the number one barrier to impact investment that the that our high net worth respondents mentioned was that their current advisors were not knowledgeable enough about impact investing, responsible investing, and wow, what okay. that meant. So we're the putting it biggest back. barrier. So they do need to catch up and learn more about what companies like Pond and what other companies are, are out there that are doing things that both are not just driving impact for the sake of impact, but where they're really meeting a fight, where they're really meeting a market problem and a social problem and are dealing with those two things at once. Okay, great. So uh, plug here, Social Finance Forum, November of every year, and they can contact you for a discount. Is that right? Yes. Early bird discounts, okay, yes. <laughs> Not out yet, but they will be. <laughs> All right. So, Brady, uh, what are we doing to uh, educate these interested? Yeah, well, so, I mean, here's a really interesting challenge, though, right? You're talking about a pool of capital of $10 billion per fund manager. And when you get to those numbers, it's very difficult for that fund manager to be able to invest into any companies that are listed on the venture. Because at $10 billion and our average market cap being $33 million, you can't, you're going to own way over 10% pretty quick. And that's outside most of their mandates. I think the bigger challenge is, you know, how do we take some of that information and the $10 billion guys, not to take, not to detract from them, but they're focused on the NASDAQ, NYSE, you know, the likes of Shell or the big renewable energy players that are developing billion dollar projects. They're not focused on the technology companies that are growing with us. The bigger challenge for us is how do we engage with those retail investors, those small cap fund managers? How do we surface, how do we surface the, the data around the social impact and allow people to make decisions off of that or use it in a trusted way to educate themselves about investment opportunities? Okay, Steve, yeah. do you have a comment here? I, I think that there's a lack of a sort of universally agreed upon impact index, something that uh, people can grab onto and hold. The index, like you mentioned, extractive industries, mining. <clears throat> there's a feeling amongst analysts and investors that they have understanding what makes a good investment in mining versus a bad investment in mining, and there's metrics that associate with that. For impact and sustainability investment, investing, it's not. It's kind of how does it make you feel? There's a, there's a real lack of a common language or a platform that allows people to make those decisions. Uh, if you take the very simple example of I have two possible investments, how do I choose between them? It's very difficult. Uh, we need to have some sort of common platform that allows us to discriminate between the various okay. may investment I, opportunities. May I jump in quickly? Yep, quickly. Um, and certainly there are, there's, there's a lot of definitions out there in the lexicon and how we look at impact is that there's drivers through two ways impact drivers through a company's operations and impact through the actual product or service that it has. So in the in private markets, we use um, B Corp certification or B Corp, the B Corp assessment to assess a company's ESG, so environmental, social, and governance parameters. And then we look at the actual product or service that they have. In the public markets, um, we rely on MSCI data that has got a lot of criteria that has picked and, and surfaces certain ESG metrics there. So it's not, it's not perfect. We are a long way from getting to a, 
a standard where you can say um, gold, silver, bronze, or however you want to rate it, but there is increasing efforts, and people are putting a lot of money to make sure that these lexicons talk to each other. But I hear you, we are a long way, we are a long way off. So, so B Corps and SASB accounting to give you like SASB, an EBITDA yes. like number. So Marie's an expert on this stuff, you can hit her up later. <laughs> so last round and final comments and final myth. Okay, we're gonna start with Brady and end with Steve and then I'll wrap it up. Um, do you have to make less money in order to do good? Absolutely not. You need to be able to balance. You need to be able to balance the two. Um, anybody that, and we saw it from 2007 through 2010, the green rush that existed where people put money at anything that was green, anything that was deemed to be solar, deemed to be renewable, raised tons of money, and if they didn't ultimately become profitable, which is what happened in 2010, none of these companies made money, they all went under and investors lost their shirt. I think where, where we are today is the evolution where people are saying, you have to run a good business, you have to have business fundamentals that are interesting, you have to show good growth, you have to have a proprietary technology that you're leveraging off, but at the same point, you have to be able to demonstrate that you, you obey these fundamental criteria in order to be able to access our investment pools of capital. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can make money and do good? Okay. Marie? Um, the Global Impact Investing Network's most recent survey of um, hundreds of billions of dollars of assets, of asset managers responded with 97% of their, of their assets and their holdings performed at or exceeded their financial expectations. So exceeded? Met or exceeded their financial expectations. I only heard exceeded. Sure, exceeded. Okay, exceeded. No. So it's, it's not just uh, you know, my personal opinion, but this is the opinion of hundreds of billions of dollars under assets where they are performing with what they were targeting or better. Okay, fantastic. I will say, plug, uh, that we're up 35% last year, uh, impacting uh, the planet positively and Congrats. impacting um, people's balance sheets positively. Mm -hmm. So at Pyfera. So that's mm -hmm. our plug. I think it comes, about, comes down to good due diligence. when investors are knowledgeable about, say, climate change or water needs or so forth, they're going to bring that into their due diligence because they fundamentally understand that sector all the better. Okay, so a minute over to you, Steve. <clears throat> There's nothing special about impact investing or sustainability investing. If the company is good, it will make money and everybody will do well. Due diligence and all the uh, associated accoutrements uh, are, are required. Uh, yes, there's good money in being green. Okay, so uh, you're on, so SVX um, and affiliates are an investor in your company, and you're listed on Brady's Exchange. Okay, so you get 30 minutes to, you convert smoke and pollution into food. And so should people invest in your company? You have 20 seconds. Yes. <laughs> Don't need the whole 20 seconds. Uh, the answer is yes. We're, we're looking for sustainability solutions. Well, guess what? We're a sustainability solution that makes tremendous money. As a matter of fact, the product we make off of the smoke that goes up the stack is normally worth a great deal more than the stuff they're making by burning the stuff to, to go up the stack. What, what are your it, gross margins? Uh, they, could, they range from 50 to 80 percent. It depends on what you're growing. It could be tremendously higher on some. There are products that are derived from algae that are worth literally millions of dollars per ton, and we make that off of a ton of CO2. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us uh, on Impact Investing, making money and doing good. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thank you.